is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Very happy to have with us tonight Tim Takis, elder law attorney. Yeah. Tim Tegas, thank you for being here. God, glad to be here again. You've been on one or two times. One or two times, yeah, since about 2000, I think. Um, 20th, 20th anniversary year, I believe. Is, is what it really? It is. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. since 2000. I was trying to think yeah. how long it's been. So you've been coming on since 2000. Thousand. And, and it's great because yeah. what we encourage people to do is to call in with their situation mm -hmm. and you can help them out. Right. When we're talking about elder law. Right, which is. And to set the tone, what right, is, is elder is, law? You know, we were talking just before we got on the air, is talking about traditional estate planning and a lot of that's kind of where a lot of elder law came out of but you know as I always say is is that you know in our, our little corner of the legal world is that we're, we're more interested in the living client than the dead client you know and the you know and of course it's a little bit more complex than that because all of our living clients need estate planning you know but our focus really on elder law is uh, what happens while they're alive you know, and particularly older people, how do they get the care that they need if they get sick, if they have a, develop a chronic illness, they have a sudden stroke, all those sorts of things. You know, how do they make sure that they maximize their independence, maintain their dignity during their lifetime, you know, figure out where they're going to live and how they're going to pay for it, you know, and all the great stuff that typically, you know, that estate tax planning attorneys really have not done, or that's really not their, that's not really in their lane. And are you, would you say your primary, the person who comes into your office, who mm -hmm. walks into your office, is it, is it often the child of, of, a, of an aging parent, or is it the aging person uh, themselves? It's a mixed bag. I mean, we, 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 we do see a lot of children coming in because they're the ones that, you know, they're the caregivers. They tend to be caregivers. And they come in and say, well, my mother is living at home. She's not doing well. Uh, we, hear, you know, we develop the story about, okay, how's, how long has mom been like this? What illnesses does she have? Uh, when did they manifest themselves? Where has she been living? Hey, what care is she getting now? And then it's like, okay, what care is she going to need in the future? You know, who's going to be providing that care? Can that care take place at home? Do we need to look at a, you know, a, do we need to bring in care or do we need to go get care, which means maybe a, an assisted living facility or a residential facility? All those sorts of complexities come into play. And what we're, yeah, we're talking about money. Yeah, and then we're also talking, we're talking about, about finances, too, because... How are you going to pay for that exactly. stuff? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And very seldom do we have clients that walk in that say, oh, I don't, you know, I don't have a problem with, or the issue is not the money. Right. You know, that, you know, unfortunately in our, you know, in the world that we live in here is, is that to get good care at home, uh, it typically runs about 20 to $25 an hour. So we're typically, so, if, so everybody wants to stay at home for the rest of their life and we'll say, well at 300 or $350 a day, you can get whatever you want. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's, that's typically 12 to $14,000 a month. Good grief. That people have to, you know, they would pay. And for most people, or at least most people that we see, mm -hmm. you know, that would typically run through what they have. And so they really have to look at other options. So that, I hadn't heard that number before. Yeah. What I always hear is the nursing home. The nursing home, right. The nursing home is very expensive it, as well. Yeah, and you're looking there at seven, eight to $9,000 a month. You know, for some facilities, it may be $10,000 plus. You know, in, in, in Tennessee, it's uh, significantly less than it would be in places like New York uh, or New Jersey or someplace up there where you're probably looking at fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars a month for nursing home care. Good grief. Yes, and good so good grief is right. Good uh -huh. grief, yeah, really. And mm -hmm. so what we, we encourage people to call in with yeah. their story, you can you can help them out. What are some things that you've seen kind of come through your door in the, in this time of year? It's summer, it's hot outside, I don't know, are things different different times of year? What what are some things you're seeing come through your door? Here recently, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and so they're running through my head all of these scenarios, and after a while, you've done this for a while. You know, they kind of, they all kind of blend <laughs> in. But you know, you see, um, you know, the family that comes in, and um, you know, they've got uh, their loved one at home, and and um, you know, it's you know, they're 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 not. I mean, I mean frankly, they don't very very. It doesn't very much yeah. between one scenario than another. You know, it, it, you're, you're typically talking about people who, you know, really are 
on the cusp of, you know, do I really, can I really stay at home? Can my mother really stay at home? You know, what are my, what are our next steps? Um, all those sorts of things that, you know, that, that, that confront caregivers every day. Mm -hmm. That's really what we see every day. You know, then you have family issues that come up, like for instance, we've got one case going on now where you know, we have a blended family, you know, we've had this case for a couple of years, you know, and the husband is still living at home and his wife is in assisted living, you know, and with blended families it's like, okay, so we're going to take care of mom and you're going to take care of dad or, you know, all those sorts of things and then as each spouse diminishes in capacity, meaning mm -hmm. the ability to take care of themselves, you know, then the more and more the children have to step up, and some children are more reluctant than others. Some of them are willing to like basically take over if they could, but that's not, not necessarily the case either. So you have all of that going on as well. That is difficult. Yes, it is difficult. And that's where you do need and, a plan. And then you have the elder that says, oh, nothing's wrong with me. I'm doing fine. You know, and when they set the house on fire, you know, and they get in the car, and you know, you don't want to you would never let your grandchildren ride ride with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm doing. I, I know how to get to the grocery store. You know, it's only this way, this way, this way. Well, yeah, until you make, you go this way and you forget and you turn that way and then you wind up in Pulaski. Oh, good grief! I mean, I did have a client that wound you know that drove from Oak Ridge to Nashville to visit his daughter, and he he got mixed up when he got to t to Nashville. Well, what what exit is it? And he oh, ran out no. of gas on the side of the interstate near Pulaski. Oh. No. Okay. The, I know it's here somewhere. Right. Yeah. That happens. He, about, and he's lucky. What about Alzheimer's? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you get a diagnosis, yes. and you can be diagnosed early. Yes, right? you can. So let's say you're diagnosed yes. very early, right. and 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 you're you're doing okay. You are. But the minute you're diagnosed, you know what what do you what do you need to start doing? Well, certainly at that point, then you are you become what we call an unhealthy older person. I mean, you were maybe a healthy older person, you know, and you had some stuff that ordinary, you know, older people typically have. But when you, you know, Alzheimer's is a disease. It is not normal aging. Okay. Okay. It is, you know, it is not what, you know, you can't say, well, everybody gets, the older they get, that they're going to wind up getting Alzheimer's disease. No, that's not normal aging. Well, I have had clients in their early 50s or late 40s that developed Alzheimer's, early onset, really early. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all know Pet, Pet Summit. Right. I think she was in her 50s right. or late 50s and she developed it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and some people get in their late 90s and they never develop it. You know, it was just one of those things. But it's not normal aging. But the point is, is that whether you develop it when you're 60 or you're 80, you know, then you have to start putting a plan in place because it's not going away. It right. is going to progress. Now, what we don't know about Alzheimer's disease necessarily is the progress of that illness. How quickly is it going to go? Is it going to be a seven to ten year journey? Is it going to be a two to three year journey? You know, and uh, we've seen, for instance, in the, the people who have early Alzheimer's are diagnosed maybe in their early 60s or late 50s. That typically goes very rapidly. Rapidly meaning maybe two to three years. You know, okay. from from basically being, you know, pretty clear-headed to, you know, almost, you know, almost comatose, or so to speak. You know, you wow. don't know anything. Okay. You know, but people, the older they develop it, you know, the ordinary types of Alzheimer's disease, it's typically maybe a seven to ten year journey. I've had clients have been diagnosed for years. Okay. Okay. You know, so, and that's what's that's you know, and then you then on top of that, for a lot of older people. They have other stuff going wrong with them. They've got diabetes. You know, they've got uh, high blood pressure. You know, they have some other illness, uh, arthritis, or whatever it is. You know, something. You know, which are called co now you're dealing with comorbidities. You know, not just not just a cognitive affliction, which the Alzheimer's is primarily of, you know, but a physical affliction, you know, and all of those things sorts of combined, you know, so then you have like a really sick human being, mm -hmm. you know, and how it interacts, you know, then you have drugs going on all over the place, so that's a, that's a real challenge. And, and one other question on that, and this is something I know a lot of people deal with, and you can yeah. call in with this question, are there new drugs 
that are making a difference. You, you've been doing this for a while, yeah. so you've seen mm -hmm. people with Alzheimer's be diagnosed and, and their journey for a while. Are we seeing new drugs that make a difference? Are we not there yet? What, what are we seeing? We're not really seeing new drugs. Uh, there is one drug, and I don't recall the, uh, the, the you know, and somebody will call in because they'll have it on their tips, fingertips more than I do. That, you know, that, that they've been in the news recently because they've, you know, it's been, it's basically developed very promising drug for against for Alzheimer's disease. Not necessarily a cure, but it could be like maybe a remission type drug. Which, you know, and this drug company has basically said, if I recall my facts right, is is that we're not going to take, we're not going to do trials. We're not going to continue trials because they're saying is trials typically are five to seven years. They're 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 multi million dollar trials, you know, and most of them don't work out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and they just apparently this drug company feels for some way or other is is that we're not going to pick up the mantle on this. Now maybe if somebody else wanders in and starts shoveling money at them, you know, maybe they'll do something. But you know, so mostly what's what what I see happening in that world about Alzheimer's is is that they're being able to they're being able to do diagnoses earlier and earlier you know they look for what are called biomarkers okay how do I know you have Alzheimer's disease can it can we do a blood test can you spit in a cup you know can you you know you know, can you uh, you know can you pee in a can you pee in a bowl or whatever right, it is, and we'll right. do all that other stuff. Can we? You know, those are biomarkers, and they can test that you way know, now. And so now they're work. You know, so now they're getting closer and closer to that. Wow. You know, and every time you you know I read about something, it's like, well, they're thinking that maybe this is a this is a biomarker for maybe a particular aspect mm -hmm. of Alzheimer's disease. You know, maybe not the like the real uh, smoking gun, so to speak. You know, but that's more and more how how close they are getting. Fascinating. Yes. All right, so that's one aspect of what we can talk about. We have a couple calls here, so let's go to the phones. Let's go to Reverend Fuzz. Hello, Reverend Fuzz. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, sir. It's Reverend Fuzz. Yes. Okay, All right. You know, your show has helped me a lot on some issues I'm always dealing with. Somebody called me, I don't know the answer, so here's a real live one here. Number one, my first question is this. At what's the number of age, what's the age number that I become elderly? Uh, or is that what, when do you become elderly? Here's my other scenario here. We got a, a lady who's got five kids. She's elderly, dementia maybe. And one kid's been taking care of that mom. You know, you've seen that. And then uh, the other kid's kind of been distant. But then all of a sudden, one of the kids steps in, kind of a black sheep, whatever you, you know, I'm not, yes, but mm -hmm. they start to care of mom. And now the kid who's been taking care of her doesn't have the right to make decisions. Mm -hmm. He wants, comes up with this power of attorney thing. What does that person, what's the scenario? How does that work out that those okay. five siblings, only one of them been caring for mom these yeah. years and stuff? But now mom is in the nursing home and or in the hospital and mm -hmm. has to go home. And uh, the one sibling says, I don't want her to go home. I want her in the nursing home. And the other sibling says, I want to take her home with me. Mm -hmm. Can that's, you that's hear a tough something one. there? Yeah, that's how, a... how do you talk to families when you got those siblings squabbling over mom yeah. and yeah. somebody may have spent yeah. mama's money? And then right. this one real quick. Okay. I know, but this is this is something I've been challenged with. Like, um, is it abuse mm -hmm. when, let's say, what is that ride? The the MTA buses that pick people up that yeah. access ride, mm -hmm. and they'll drop people off and leave them um, all alone until somebody comes and to open up, up the building, mm -hmm. or or they're like an hour or two hours late picking them up. Isn't that kind of like abuse? And that's just something I'm throwing in. So. Okay. All right, well, let's talk about all that. Time. Yeah. We Thank got, you, Reverend. Okay, Fuzz. so there's three questions there. Right. Okay, the first question is: Is how do you know when you're older or an elder? Yeah. How do you define? You know, and, and basically, I'll say, you know, my answer to that question is: Is that they're two years older than I am. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay. All good. right. When you start getting like old, when you start getting older, like I am, I'm 63, and I mentioned this. It's funny because I was on Morning Line a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. You know, when the same question came up, it's like, how do you know when you're older? And I always say, is well, two years older than me. <laughs> so now, after a while, I won't be able to get away with that. No. But, but just figure that. Okay, maybe maybe a good rule of thumb is you know when you when you qualify for when you're old enough and you're qualifying for Medicare, you know maybe that's a good rule of thumb. Sixty five. Now that doesn't mean you know el being elderly is really a you know it, it it's mostly about you know what planning do you need to have and take to start taking place that maybe differs than you were when you were 45 okay right. just like you know the next scenario you know we have a ch you know we have a, a a mother who has five children you know and she's had one caregiver that's been with the, with mom you know and regrettably is mom never decided to get their ducks in a row so presumably there's no power of attorney in place so mom hasn't said okay son you're taking care of me so I'm gonna name you as my power of attorney you know I, so you're the one that's gonna you know be able to make decisions for me if I don't if I can't make them for myself and mom says that to the other siblings right and it's like get on board right this and is we the way hope, it's gonna be yeah and we hope that she would say that right but that's that's just a verbal thing she just said it out loud but if she's got it written down on a piece of paper that's called a that's called a power of attorney mm -hmm. where she names this son first and this daughter second that child third and fourth and fifth don't do it by committee Mm -hmm. Okay, she's got Reverend Fuzz, she's got five children. Don't let just, don't say, I'm going to give it to all five. And we've seen stuff like that. You know, you, you, you don't, you, I could go down that road after for a while about seeing the, the durable powers of attorney that says, well, I name my son and or my daughter to be power of attorney. It's like, well, and or or, which is it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so, okay, number one, number two, number three. So you have a clear line of authority is what you need to have. Unfortunately, in that situation, you know, the son who was the caregiver, he was, he was equal in the eyes of the law because mom never designated anybody. Right. You know, he had no more authority than anybody else just because he'd been with mom for two years or however long she'd been his, he'd been his, her caregiver. She had all that time, presumably, to make a, dis, you know, to, to get something in place. And what do you do when the situation is that far gone? Because I'm sure there are a lot of people that are in that situation. Yeah. What, what's the next step? It could be, you know, it could be that if she can't make decisions for herself, you know, and she goes to the hospital or she goes to the bank or, or somebody goes to the bank and says, well, I need to do banking for my mother. Well, where is she? Well, she's got dementia, you know, and she, she can't make decisions for herself. Well, do you have a power of attorney? The bank's, you know, and, and you say no, and the bank says, well, I'm sorry, we can't. Right. You know, you may wind up in court. Ugh. You know, where, where somebody gets appointed her conser conservator. Maybe the children petition the court. Judge Kennedy here in Nashville says, okay, I'm going to name this person over here. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's the right person. Maybe it's the caregiver, the person that's taken care of mom for the last two years. But it doesn't have to be. It may not be. So the lesson there is you want, if, if you were the one getting older, you want to take some charge. Yes, because what what is the situation there that so that is the, wor the worst thing is they lost control. Yeah, and that's what people want. Mm -hmm. You know, they come to us because they want to they want to stay in control. You know, that's the key thing for them is to make sure how do I stay how do we stay control of this so we can take care of our mother without somebody else stepping in and telling us how, how to do that. And when you lose control, it's hard to get it back. It is hard to get it back. And that's where they are. And, and then the other are. was abuse, I think, right? Yeah, abuse. Do you remember what he was yeah, asking? Yeah, he was there? saying is okay. You're writing the you know so you have an elderly person writing MTA. The person gets off in some neighborhood. There's nobody around. They have to wait for an hour. You know, is that abuse? I don't know the answer to that. But you know what? If Reverend, if Reverend Fuzz knows about a case like that he needs to call MTA mm -hmm. because you know that's that's part of you know it, we are mandatory reporters in the state you know for elder you know for for elder abuse okay now you know, and there's a, you know and it's confidential that you know if, if Reverend Fuzz says look here's what I here's what I was told you know and he gets n names dates you know the bus line whatever it is you know maybe something maybe something positive can come out of that that's what we want. 
All right, Reverend Fuzz, thanks for the call. We are going to really open up the phone lines now. We have one uh, on the line, so call in if you'd like. Uh, there's the number, 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. Alfred, uh, others, hang on the line. Uh, we'll take a break. Be back right after this.